This is the I Love Success Podcast. I'm Peter Jurukowski, and I have made a vow to myself to help as many people as possible to achieve their dreams. Let's get started. Hey guys, and welcome back to the I Love Success Podcast. My virtual world tour continues, and uh, today I'm traveling to a city out, outside Austin, Texas. What was the name again, Dr. Joe? New Braunfels. New Braunfels. I'm still working on, on, on learning that. Hopefully I can come Me and visit too. you one day. And we have an amazing guest today, Dr. Joe Vitale. He is uh, all about abundance, the law of attraction. He's written almost 80 books known uh, for his appearance in The Secret. But much more than that, he's a beautiful human being, and I'm honored and grateful to have him on the show. So welcome, Dr. Joe Vitale. Thank you. Been looking forward to this moment. I love success, too. That's awesome. And let's, let's talk about that. What I'm trying to do, I'm trying to redefine the concept of success. Mm. Uh, so what does success look like for you? Well, um, Contrary to what a lot of people think, it's not about the material world. Success is a balance of the inner and the outer. In terms of freedom, it's being able to do what you want to do when you want to do it. In terms of the outer world, it could be that you have measurable success that you can tell people about and show them credentials of some sort. But I really think success is measured individually on the inside. And it's really a balance of the spiritual and the material. When you have that kind of balance, you should be happy, you should be secure, you should be feeling successful. I think, I mean, that's what we're all looking for, but it, it's uh, yes. so hard to find. Like, uh, how, do you, how do you go about to, to, to get to that place? Well, it's easier than what most people think. For example, just today on Instagram, I posted a two-minute meditation. And the two-minute meditation brings people right to the very place that they're longing to be. And this is for everybody. We can, we can cut this interview short right now. I can walk you through the meditation. I'll drop the mic and I'm out of here. <laughs> <laughs> but let me run through this because I mean this in all sincerity and I want to be of the most help to the people that are watching your show here. We're all wanting something and in that pursuit of wanting something, it could be that we want a business that is improving. It could be that we want better health. It could be that we want financial gain. We want a new car. We want a new house. We want a soulmate. We want spiritual enlightenment. But the hidden reason for wanting all of that is because we want to be happier. We think that when we achieve those things, we'll finally be happy. The punchline is you won't be. You'll have a flicker, just a flicker of satisfaction and then you'll be looking down the road going what's next what do i do now how do i set off those dopamine chemicals in the brain so i can keep this little rush of happiness going so the two minute exercise i posted on uh, instagram and facebook i'll just give you a condensed version but i tell people first of all take out a yellow sheet of paper here's my pad i walk my talk i do this too you take out your yellow piece of paper you take out your pen and you write down everything you want to have, do, or be. This is your wish list. It's your goal list. It's your secret list. You don't have to show it to me. You don't have to show it to Peter. You don't have to show it to anybody. So you put everything down. I don't care whatever the hidden agenda is that you want or the secret fantasy that you have. You put everything down on that list. That's the first step. Second step is you review the list and say, have I been honest? Is there something else I'd really like to have? Do I secretly want a million-dollar car? Who cares? Write it down. And we're not caring at all about how anything will manifest. We live in a magical world, so for the time being, we're going to pretend you uh, can have, do, or be anything. So put the anything on the list. That's the second step. Third step is to imagine what it would be like to have all of that right now. You look at the list and you go, wow, I'm driving my cool car. It cost me a million dollars, but I paid for it. And look at this. And I got my man or my gal beside me, my soulmate, my lover, whatever it happens to be. And you are just so complete. You are so satisfied. You are so successful that this is it. And you are in that feeling. Well, here's the punchline. That feeling you can have right now. 
as you go through that list and you imagine having all of those things, that feeling will be generated within you. It's that feeling that you think all those things are going to bring you, but you can bypass it and have the feeling of success right now. Further punchline, this is the back door to getting all the things you wanted. You made a list of all the things you wanted, then you checked it twice, and then you imagine you already had it, so you're in that feeling of embodiment of success. It's that feeling of embodiment of success that will help bring all of that stuff to you and you to it. There is the miracle exercise of today. Do that and then look for miracles. I love that. Um... Joe, because I, I was just, when you were saying that, I'm just thinking about my own life. I, I was a world medalist in karate yeah. and my best performances was when I already felt successful. Yes. Yes. It, That's exactly it. it. Yeah. I and mean, it's so hard though, because we hold on to this notion of that we have to be serious and, and, and like tends to, to actually accomplish something, but it's the reverse, right? It's more sincerity than it is seriousness. Yeah. I spoke on the same stage with Mike Tyson a year or so ago in Thailand. And I'll never forget Mike standing up there and said, when he was 12 years old, he was wearing the heavyweight boxing champion belt in his mind. But in his mind, it was real. It was done. It was already complete. He was already a success. And everything he did from that 12 to 21 or whatever it was when he actually became world heavyweight boxing champion was all the leg work and the gym work and the training that he did to get there. But he already owned it. And I think that's the secret that you know and I know and maybe a lot of your viewers know, but it's the one we're passing along. The whole idea of success is something you can have right now. And the more you have success right now, the more the outer world will reflect it. Much like Mike Tyson, 12 years old. He's going to be heavyweight boxing champion of the world. Yeah, right. He owns it. He becomes heavyweight boxing champion of the world. Same with you talking about the world medalist and your karate championships. You already owned it before you got it. And it's that ownership that helps manifest it in reality. And how do we relieve the pressure that most of us go with? Like a lot of people, they have these amazing dreams, but it's also a backpack full of rocks. And like, how, how, do, we, how do we get rid of that to, to be free and to, to enjoy the pursuit instead of just, hey, I got to do this. And if I don't, uh, I'm not going to be happy. And when you finally reach there, you've, you've sacrificed so much and you're not even happy. So like, how can we talk about that? Yeah, that's a great thing. And I, I love that metaphor, that image of a backpack full of rocks. So what we have to do is unpack it. We have to unpack it. We have to one by one, throw the rocks out. And this is what I think is the missing secret to success. You know, I was in the movie, The Secret, and whether people saw it or not, I would encourage them to see it. And whether I'm in it or not, it doesn't matter. It's still a great movie. But a lot of people criticized it by saying it didn't talk enough about action or clearing or some of the things you need to do to be successful. Um, I am championing the idea that you have to get clear. The law of attraction, mind power, all the things we know about success, success principles from Napoleon Hill and Claude Bristol and all of the success classic literature that's out there is all true. But the thing that I found was missing, which I call the missing secret, is the idea of getting clear. Now, what are we getting clear of? When we want to do something, we have an intention. I want to win a world medal in karate. I want to be a singer-songwriter. I want to open my own business and increase it by 50%. I want to be a best-selling author. I don't care. We all have these intentions, but what we don't look at is what I call counter-intentions, which, to use your image, are like rocks. We're carrying rocks. For example, one of my most recent books is called Money Loves Speed. And in Money Loves Speed, I said one of the, the beliefs that virtually everybody has, including the people watching this right now, is a universal unconscious belief. And until we unpack that rock, we're going to find it difficult to be successful with money. And so let me explain this. 
let me unpack this, if you will, and take the rock and throw it away. <laughs> the, uh, first of all, we all want money. You want money, I want money, and we probably want it for valid reasons. We wanna take care of our family and friends, we wanna pay our bills, maybe we have goals that we wanna achieve and money helps us along the way to achieve them. We have positive reasons, great intention. However, if we unconsciously think money's bad or money corrupts or money is evil, we will sabotage ourselves and not even know it. The biggest belief, and believe me, I've traveled the world. I've spoken in Russia, I've spoken in the Ukraine, and Poland, Italy, Bermuda, Canada. I mean, countries I didn't even know existed when I was growing up. I've spoken there. They all have the same belief. I was in Iran in December. They have the same belief. And that belief is money is the root of all. Mm. Everybody just said evil. So let's stop and unpack this a little bit more. If you want money for a great reason, you gotta pay your bills for one thing, you want the internet access, you gotta pay the internet or the electricity, utility, whatever it happens to be as a simple example. Positive reason for money. But if you think money's evil, you will block your attempts to get money. You'll blame it on the economy, you'll blame it on a virus, the pandemic, oh, I can't make any money right now. Uh, you'll blame it on the president, you'll blame it on the economy, you'll blame it on chaos, you'll blame it on, you'll blame, blame, you'll push out and look at other people and not realize your own mindset is blocking the money. So in my book, Money Loves Speed, what I do is explain it. I want to explain it for your people so that they understand and can be free of this. Money is the root of all evil is a clip of a longer statement from biblical literature. And first of all, we don't actually know what was said 5,000 years ago because it was written down after the fact and it was interpreted, reinterpreted, paraphrased, brought in the modern times. So it's lost in translation. But the longer phrase is actually the love of money is the root of all evil. That's the longer phrase. So let's look at that. The successful wealthy people who are happy, healthy, successful, well-adjusted, don't love money. They don't love money. They appreciate money. They leverage money. They use money. In my book, I have a quote from Arnold Patton, and he said, the sole purpose of money is to express appreciation. The sole purpose of money is to express appreciation. So Peter, you can see by unpacking just that one belief, we're throwing a rock out of the backpack that we've been carrying around. So we need to look at the rocks, which are beliefs. They're the negative beliefs, they're the limiting beliefs. For example, I'm on a roll here, so I'm gonna keep talking. Unless you interrupt me or tell me to shut up. Oh, you're doing great. I got the floor. <laughs> <laughs> um, I am gonna be 67. So about seven years ago, it was on my bucket list to be a musician. I wanted to be a singer songwriter. I had no music experience, no musical education, didn't sing in the shower, didn't sing in karaoke, didn't sing behind the wheel of the car. So I had to learn everything from scratch. So at the age of 60, bucket list, I wanna be a musician, I wanna write songs, sing songs, record songs. First thing to happen, terror, terror. Who the hell am I to learn how to do all of this stuff at age 60? Well, that's a belief. That was one of the rocks in my backpack. And then I, I looked at things like, well, I can't sing. I've never been able to sing. Another rock in my backpack. And so I had to look at every one of those rocks one by one, and there's enough tools that I know and I teach, and you would know as well, that we can find the beliefs and take them out. As I did that seven years ago, I unpacked the backpack that was holding me down, freed me. And Peter, I've recorded 15 albums. Amazing. I have 15 albums. I'm in Rolling Stone magazine. My band is in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Several of my songs were nominated for the Posse Award, which is the Grammys of positive music. I went and studied with Melissa Etheridge, a rock icon, in her house. I have had songwriting lessons with some of the greatest songwriters. I'm not, none of this is to brag. All of this is to say, look, I was age 60. I wanted to be a musician. Backpack on back of me almost stopped me because I was almost listening to the rocks. But as I unpacked the rocks and threw them away one by one, freedom. And I've actually, I've sung on stage, I've sung on, 
I've played on ABC TV. <laughs> I could go on. So this is the beauty, uh, and you know this all so well, but I, I'm just sharing the enthusiasm and the key point. The missing secret is getting clear. What's getting clear? Use your metaphor, get rid of the rocks so that you can do what you really want to do. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. And I mean, I, I heard you speak about uh, you wanted, like a long time ago, you wanted to be an author and you had this belief that you had to struggle. And, and I related so much with that because in my life, a lot of times, I've told myself that I have to struggle in order to succeed. Uh, so can you just talk a little bit about that and how we remove those beliefs? Yeah. Well, thank you for bringing that up. First of all, I don't know if your audience knows me or not. So um, I'll quickly just say I was homeless in the late 1970s. I was in poverty for 10 years and I was struggling. I wanted to be an author. And of course, this is before the internet. This is before wonderful gifts like shows that you're doing to help people like this one. We didn't have any of that. They didn't exist. The internet wasn't even a whisper on anybody's mind back then. Yeah. And I'm doing this alone. I felt like me against the universe. And good God, was it tough. And I was disciplined. I was writing. I was reading. I would go to the library and read all the books. I'd do all the exercises. I was doing all the right things, but I wasn't achieving my results. And it frustrated me. It angered me. Yeah. Why was I homeless? Why was I in poverty? And as I did the soul exploration, which because I was doing it alone took forever, I realized that I had a belief that I needed to suffer first to be successful later. And when I realized, wait a minute, is that true? And I started to question the belief, which is one way to, to get rid of beliefs, start questioning them. And would ask myself, do I actually need to struggle? Do I need to? Does every successful person in the world need to struggle first? When you kind of look at it with that x-ray of non-judgmental neutrality, you realize, no, there have been plenty of people who have been successful and they didn't have to be homeless. They didn't have to be in poverty. They did the work, they, they were patient. Over time, they achieved whatever it was that they were wanting. Then the other thing I looked at is I was modeling my life after authors I admired, but the authors I admired were self-destructive. Jack London was a deep influence on me. He wrote The Call of the Wild and The Sea Wolf and Martin Eden and 50 other books. He was dead by the time he was 40 years old. He was alcoholic. He was suicidal. He was uh, melancholy. He was very adventurous and very dramatic, but it cut him short. And I didn't realize it because I was doing it unconsciously. I would marvel at his life and go, oh my God, what a colorful, dramatic life. And look, at he's one of the greatest authors of all time. He's an American classic literature author. Everybody would agree The Call of the Wild is one of the greatest books of all time. He wrote it. He wrote it. So I'm admiring him and unconsciously I'm branding his life on my own brain. And so when I go out into the world and I'm saying, I want to be an author like Jack London, a part of me is processing that as you've got to have an unhappy, adventurous, melancholy, even suicidal life to be like him. So because of the books I was reading, like The Magic of Believing by Claude Bristol, which is a wonderful success literature book, I was really looking at my beliefs. And again, I'm doing it alone, which is a tough road to do when you try to change yourself. You can certainly do it and people do it. And I did it but it's tougher and it takes longer. And I look at in, the, in the mirror and say, what beliefs might I have to create the experience I'm having? And this is something I would invite everybody watching to do. You look in the mirror and you ask yourself, what beliefs might you have that's creating the life experience you have right now? So if you're struggling in some area or you're longing for something, but you're finding it frustrating to get there, what beliefs might be creating it? And it's an open-ended question because you're fishing. And what are you fishing for? The rocks in your subconscious mind. When you find them, sometimes just bringing them into the light of awareness causes them to vanish. When you actually look at it, like, I didn't know I had the belief that I had to suffer like Jack London in order to be successful. I did not know that was there. But when I looked in the mirror and I started to explore it and I realized, oh, wow, that's there. I didn't know that. That weakened the belief right there. Just knowing it was there weakened the belief. 
And then when I went to the next step and said, well, could there be examples of authors who are successful, but they're happy and health, healthy, well-adjusted, great families, doing well, they're prolific, they're productive, they're profitable. And I found them and thought, well, what the hell am I doing modeling Jack London's life? Model Ray Bradbury, model some of the other greats that are out there. I can model Jack London's writing style, but not Jack London's lifestyle. So one of the key ways of getting clear is with the light of awareness. One of my other books, I'm a book guy, so I'm always going to be holding up books. There's books behind me. I just came out with books, so forgive me. <laughs> the Art and Science of Results is the most recent book. And I'm holding it up because it says the nine most powerful ways to clear blocks to your ultimate success. So there's lots of different ways to get clear of the rocks. But it begins with, first of all, knowing you got some rocks. You got a backpack on, you got some rocks in there, and then you start questioning, what might the rocks be? And then when you find them, do I want to believe this rock? Might there be a lighter rock to believe or a better one? And can I throw that one away? And you start to unpack it to free yourself. The mind is such an amazing thing. And... I want to talk about visualization. So okay. as an athlete, I visualize myself winning. I visualize myself going into that fight, seeing everything. But as a martial artist, I do something that you spoke about called negative visualization, right? Martial artists, we meditate upon death. We med meditate mm -hmm. on, on the things in our life that is also uh, negative in order to see what we have. And I love when you spoke about that. So can you just share like what is negative visualization and, and why should we even do something like that? I love that you did your homework. I do so many interviews where people don't have a clue what I'm doing outside of the very superficial. He was in The Secret and he's written a bunch of books. You've obviously listened to a few interviews, done your research, done your legwork. And so you're asking me very informed, wise questions. So the first thing I want to do is just acknowledge you. I'm very impressed with you and what you're doing, plus you're helping a lot of people, and I'm flattered that I'm here, and I feel grateful at the same time. So negative visualization is a technique from ancient Stoicism, and the last year and a half have probably been the worst of my entire life. Uh, going through a divorce, still am at this point. Uh, my father died about a year ago this time. I have a younger family member who attempted suicide. Um, of course, we have the pandemic, we have the chaos, we have the violence in the streets, we have the whole world on upheaval, which for me as a public speaker means all of my travels are canceled, all of my major income is canceled, all of my speaking engagements are canceled. Some of the, the best things I do and the most influential things I do are canceled. I'm also in a new relationship who quickly, after we got together, developed a near-death disease and is still recovering from it at this point. So why am I telling you all this? I looked for help. I looked for anything to help get me through the day because some of these days have been pretty damn rough. And stoicism came to the rescue. And stoicism is about surviving and thriving. Stoicism is about your mindset as you go through experiences like what I've been going through or what everybody's going through right now in the world with the pandemic still in place as we make this uh, interview. And the Stoics, in a sense, kind of say, we told you so, meaning there's always going to be rough rides in life. There's always going to be rough roads. The pandemic we're in right now, we had one 100 years ago. Marcus Aurelius, who's the poster boy for Stoicism, lived through a 10-year pandemic. Michael de Montaigne, who's the father of the American essay in, the, in France, I think in the 1500s, went through a plague. I mean, none of these things are actually new. It's new to us because we're going through it. But the Stoics look at us and they go, look, we kind of told you these things could come about. And so they have a negative visualization to help us prepare. All of the people who focus on just the secret or just feeling good or just the law of attraction or just on what they want, along the way, they run into a block, they run into a snag, things don't seem to go as well as they pursue their goal of success, and they give up. They give up because a part of them wasn't aware that reality is gonna throw something at you along the way. And the something that's throwing at you isn't necessarily bad. 
it, that too comes from stoicism. It's like, how do you look at it? Is it a good thing or a bad thing? You have choice. So the negative visualization is to help us prepare. My most vivid example of this is when I decided that I was going to sing on stage for the first time in my life, I swear to God, I was terrified. My band is in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. They have 60 years experience. They're professional. They do it for a living. I do not. Like I had said before, I never sang anywhere in public. For me to sing with a seasoned professional band and be the lead singer on stage in front of an audience terrified me. <laughs> and people would say, how are you terrified? You public speak all the time. Public speaking and public singing are two different things. <laughs> I remember Kevin Bacon, the, the famous actor, who's also a singer-songwriter. He said, people don't realize that when you go to sing, in his words, he said, it's fucking terrifying. <laughs> That's Kevin Bacon, yeah. who's in front of people, in front of the camera, in front of the screen all the time. So to prepare myself, I took some online classes with Usher. And people say I shouldn't say this, but I didn't even know who Usher was. <laughs> He's a world famous musician. I had no idea. All I knew was he had a, an online class, a master class on performing. I was like, oh yeah, this is on performing. I don't know who the hell a guy is. <laughs> well, it was a turning point. He was actually wonderful. He gave so much information, and one of them was along the lines of a negative visualization. And I still remember, I prepped for two months before I actually did my singing debut with my band live on stage in Austin. And I remember the moment I'm watching Usher, and he said, you're going to do everything right. You're going to practice. You're going to memorize your songs. You're going to visualize your success. You're going to do everything. You're going to dress right. You're going to be fit. You're going to do everything that you know to do. He says, the night of the performance, something's got to go wrong. He said, something's got to go wrong. He says, I don't know what it is, but something's going to go wrong. And you might as well expect it. You might, might as well prepare for it. You might as well visualize it as a kind of a negative visualization. Why? So it doesn't stop you. And I always remembered that. He talked about going on stage and he was going to perform singing and dancing for two hours. And he came out, he stumbled, and he broke two ribs. He kept going anyway. The show must go on. But he broke two freaking ribs. <clears throat> so the night of my performance, mics didn't work, weather was bad, friends who said they were going to show up didn't show up, uh, songs that I had memorized, I couldn't remember all my songs. There were things that went bad. But because I had done the negative visualization, I didn't crumble. I didn't fold. I didn't run home crying. I didn't stop the show. I delivered. And at the end of my performance, I got a standing ovation. Negative visualization is often the missing secret to the happy-go-lucky, goody two-shoes of the New Age movement, where they only want to focus on butterflies and bunny rabbits. But there's also tigers and lions and rhinos out there and it should be part of our preparation for success is to realize we should be aware that a rhino could show up at any point and if one does what are we going to do I'm, gonna, I'm running that way you know have it in advance so as the stoics say you won't be surprised it's like oh i knew something was coming ah, there it is then handle it and move on I love that. And, and I know every time I've had great performance and something crazy have happened right before. And before I, like a couple of years ago, I didn't realize why, why that was, but I changed the belief. So now when this happened, I just visual, visualize myself standing on a mountain, asking myself, how bad do you fucking want this? Like, it's, it's just a test. Like, are you going to quit like most people or are you going to Keep going, right? I love that. That's a great insight. One of the things that I also receive from Stoicism is the idea that the challenge that's in front of us is actually there to develop a latent strength within us. And the example the Stoics use is Hercules. That if Hercules didn't have foes to fight, Hercules would not have developed muscles or strength, or a intention that was ironclad. It was the very enemy, the very opponent, the very foe 
that helped Hercules become Hercules. And I look at that even today with things that are going on in my life. I'm looking at it like there's a strength that hasn't been developed in me in my life previous, but because of what's in front of me now, I'm developing that strength. And so what's in front of me, the challenge, which looks like it's something we should all complain about, is actually a gift. The opponent ends up being a gift. I'm, I've been doing interviews about the pandemic, and I actually have called it um, the divine conspiracy. The divine conspiracy, because everybody has conspiracies. There, some people argue, is it real? Is it not real? Who's behind it? Who started the conspiracy? And it's all negative. Doesn't serve anything. Doesn't help anybody. And they just clash. They just fight. And so I was meditating on it, and I got the insight, wait a minute, this is kind of like what the Stoics talk about. This is actually a good thing or at least could be seen as a good thing. And I called it the divine conspiracy. And I was interviewed by London Real TV. And I, I said it, and he says, well, what do you mean it's a divine conspiracy? I said, I think the divine, which could be God, it could be nature, it could be the universe, the cosmos, there's all kinds of names for this power force that we're all part of, which I think is an intelligent being. And so the divine, has actually created this and sent us to our rooms. We've all been told, go inside. Well, to me, that has a double meaning. Not only go inside your house, go inside you. The divine has put us on a timeout. The divine has said, go inside, go inside yourself, meditate, contemplate, reflect, and reset. From that perspective, this is actually a good thing. There's lots of people who are learning how to make money from home. People who couldn't have gone to their jobs or maybe even right now are still not going to their jobs, but they're sitting at home and thanks to the internet, 100 years ago when there was a pandemic, there was no internet, there was no Facebook. People were very much on their own and confused. Well, we're confused, but we can share our confusion over Facebook. So all of this is actually a good thing. And it's helping us develop strength. Like some people who wanted to learn how to make money from home never took the time to do it. I got the time to do it now. Some people will always said, well, I always wanted to learn a language or a musical instrument. Well, go to YouTube. You're at home and you can do it. People who said, I wanted to learn how to meditate or I wanted to reconnect with the spiritual side of me. Now's the time. So the divine conspiracy can be seen as a good thing. Yeah, I love that. And uh, Joe, can we talk heart to heart? You know, you've had, <laughs> of course. All, you've had all these challenges the last year, and you're this guy that are helping other people. How do you deal with that in your own life when you are supposed to have all the answers, quote unquote, oh. but you're being challenged yourself? Peter, you're good. That's a, that's a wonderful question admittedly the last year and a half have been a deep hard struggle the beginning of it when i filed for divorce which i thought would be easy and effortless because i was willing to give away the farm um no kids i wasn't struggling resisting so i thought it would be an easy overnight thing it's turned out to be a tragedy it's turned out to be surreal in a way i can't even understand and so in the early days of all that oh was that ever tough I would walk the streets smoking a cigar, kind of talking to the universe, going, "What? how do I handle this? How do I get through this? Those were fricking hard, dark nights. So I would go back to my tried and true methods, the very things I teach about and talk about and write about. For example, I'm wearing a shirt that says, I love you, I'm sorry. There's four key phrases on it. I love you, I'm sorry, please forgive me, thank you. And the shirt is reflecting a Hawaiian healing tradition called Ho'oponopono. And I've written about Ho'oponopono in two books, Zero Limits, and 10 years later, I wrote At Zero. And it's a kind of a prayer that you use to get clear of the rocks that are behind you. And when I was walking the streets, smoking cigars and feeling miserable, I was carrying a lot of rocks, guilt rocks, resentment rocks, grief rocks, deservingness rocks, self-esteem rocks. I mean, there was all kind of rocks in my backpack. Yeah. And so I would use, I love you, I'm sorry, please forgive me, thank you, as a kind of a prayer using the whole Ho'oponopono technique to help me get through the day. 
And I cannot tell you with honesty that this was an overnight success. I still struggle some every day now. But as I mentioned earlier, I reached. It's like, where is, what can help me? I found stoicism, which I never really looked at before in my life because I thought the Stoics were all about being robots. No feelings at all, just logical. And that's not true. They uh, own their feelings. They just don't want to be controlled by their feelings. And I thought, well, that was very useful to me. And there was a lot of statements. There's one from Marcus Aurelius. In fact, it's on my wall over there. And it basically says, if you can endure it, then endure it. Stop complaining. And I would stop and say, okay, this is a fucking miserable experience in my life. I mean, this is raw, ugly. Can I endure it? Yeah. I don't want to, but can I? Yes. Well, if you can, then buck up and endure it. That would get me through on days. And then I would do the whole Pono Pono virtually all the time. And I'm not adverse to asking for help. I think it's one of the secrets to success. I have one counselor that has been with me since 1985. She knew me when I was absolutely broke, unpublished, and unknown. And she, it's Mandy Evans. Mandy Evans is still around. I still call her the original miracles coach. And she helped me back in those unknown struggle days in 1985 and on, and as needed to this moment. And I would call for help. I would say, I'm having trouble unpacking my rocks, to continue with our metaphor. And she would help me. But I also did other things. I would read books by different people. I'm obviously a book freak. And I'd always look for books for answers. But I'd read a book by a, an authority. And if I was really impressed with him, I'd find the author and hire him and say, help me get through this. So I also played, which gonna, it's going to sound stupid, I guess, or childish. But I would play the glad game which is the game, the game from Pollyanna. Pollyanna is the famous children's book. It came out in 1913. There's been numerous movies made from Mary Pickford in the silent movies to Walt Disney did one. There's been TV shows. At the core of Pollyanna is this little orphan girl who was taught by her poor father to look for the good in every person and in every moment. And I would play the glad game. I actually even wrote a song called the glad game. It's on, I think, my last album called The Great Something. And I would, I would play the game. I would go, there's good here somewhere. And I admit, sometimes it took more than a minute to find it. But I would look for the good at every person and every moment. And the other thing I would focus on, which is the extension of the glad game, is gratitude. I still believe that gratitude is the single most powerful thing we can do to transform ourselves Anybody can do it, any moment, any situation, costs nothing. It's a matter of taking a breath and looking around and going, okay, I can be grateful and find anything around you. It can be a pen, <clears throat> your coffee, your phone, the internet, lights, I mean, anything. And you start talking about why you're grateful for that. And as you start to feel grateful, it'll expand through your being and you'll lift yourself up. And I found doing that also helped me. So uh, there's probably other things I'm forgetting, but uh, the raw truth is it's been a struggle, but I also know, this, I know the sun will rise again. You know, the sun always rises. I don't care what everybody's going through. And I'm, we're all going through something. I wrote a song called Everybody's Going Through Something. We all are. And I don't care what it is. Every storm ends at some point. Every rain stops at some point. The sun always comes up every morning. We just remember that this too will pass. We can do it. Me too. Dr. Joe, first of all, thank you for being so vulnerable here and, and sharing so open heartedly. Uh, really appreciate it. Uh, thank you so much. Let's let's do let's do a fun exercise. Let's let's say that we are in a room with um, like the biggest critic of the law of attraction. And he, <laughs> he's sitting there or she's sitting there and just like, what the fuck is this? How does it work? Why does it work? I can you just talk about that. Yeah. 
I, I love the setup with the biggest critic of the law of attraction and several people come to mind because I've met the critics over the years <laughs> and there are some that are just wearing guns. They are diehard non-believers who want to shoot me and shoot anybody who believes in positive thinking. <laughs> so I would say, and I'm just kind of thinking out loud, what's so wonderful is you ask these great questions, but I had never met you before. I didn't know the questions before. So this is very much in the moment. This is the raw moment of life, and I love it. That's where the energy is. That's where the juice is. So I'm imagining that we've got this armed critic who is just putting down the law of attraction uh, no matter what. Uh, actually, I'm thinking of somebody when I was in Russia. There was a journalist who clearly was a critic <laughs> of me, the secret and the law of attraction. He never smiled. He had this intense look on his face. And no matter what I said, it was like, it's not going to work here. <laughs> Not in Russia. <laughs> and I'm laughing because one of the things that I point out to these people is, do you have people who also criticize the secret in your life? I will ask them. And they will always say, yeah, uh, of course. You know, I'm, I'm in a Facebook group and critics of the secret or something like that. <laughs> and, and of course they do. And it's like you're demonstrating the law of attraction. Like attracts like. All the people who hate the law of attraction are in the hate law of attraction group on Facebook. The people who are fans of law of attraction, which fortunately and amazingly is millions of people, many times more than the critics, but they're also in a group. How did that happen? How does that happen? And you can just kind of break it down and go, well, you know, we have like interest. Uh, we don't like the secret. We do like the secret. And that's, you know, we just kind of gather. And I'm saying you're demonstrating the law of attraction because it's working on a level you don't look at. The law of attraction works on the subconscious mind level, which is why a lot of people don't understand it. They'll think, oh, I'm sitting here and I'm thinking about money, but I don't, where's the money? I don't see it. And I'm telling them what you're getting, what you're attracting isn't a match to your conscious thoughts. It's a match to your subconscious thoughts. You can sit there and go, I am going to attract the sexy person that I want to go out with and not do anything and not change your self-concept or your self-image or your beliefs about, is it possible? Do I deserve it? Am I attractive? Am I loving? Are all the good ones taken? If you don't deal with all of those beliefs, you'll be looking around forever and you won't get the very thing you say you want. This is why I tell people, again, we talked about this earlier, the missing secret is getting clear. What are you getting clear of? The blocks in your subconscious mind. When your conscious mind and your subconscious mind are aligned, then you can go ahead and get the sexy romance or the money or the karate tournament or whatever it happens to be. So I tell the critics, look, this is all working. It's like the law of gravity. You can dismiss it all you like. And the more you dismiss it, you will find people who are aligned with the dismissal of it because you are demonstrating the very thing you're criticizing. It's like I had lunch with a woman who we were talking about affirmations as a way to create success. And she said, I tried affirmations, but affirmations don't work for me. I thought about it and I said, um, you realize that's an affirmation? And I saw her head twist like she didn't, she heard it for the first time. And I said, affirmations don't work for me is an affirmation that affirmations don't work for me. You are proving affirmations work for you by the very freaking affirmation you're saying. <laughs> yeah. So there's a whole, <laughs> I love that. you know, you, you and I can have fun with this, but if there was actually a gun toting critic here right now, they wouldn't hear us yeah. because part of it is, there's an inner resistance to the law of attraction because it also implies responsibility. It's the same thing with in Ho'oponopono, we're responsible for everything going on in our lives. Most people don't want to hear that. Most people want to hear, oh, I couldn't succeed because of, you know, that person. Or I couldn't succeed because of, yeah, I didn't want me to. I couldn't succeed because of, just fill in the blank. They don't want to take responsibility. It's much like when I was in Russia and that journalist said, this stuff doesn't work in Russia. He is using Russia as the excuse for not taking responsibility to implement this stuff. So I would say, if we were actually talking to a critic, it'd be pretty rare for them to actually hear us. 
they would be filtering it much like anybody does through their own belief system. And if their belief system is it's a scam, then that's all they're going to see. What is abundance and how do you go from scarcity to abundance? You know, in, in that book I held up, Money Loves Speed, I have a quote from Arnold Patton. And Arnold Patton said, we don't create abundance. We create limitation. And the first time I heard it, it was so mind blowing. I was like, oh my God, we don't create abundance, which means abundance is our natural state. If we don't have it, it's because we created limitation. Where did we create the limitation? In our mind. For most of us, I talk to people all the time and I've got a coaching program and occasionally do some mentoring. And I ask people, I said, were your parents Mr. and Mrs. Buddha? No. Virtually all of us have been born into a world of lack and limitation. We inherited the negative limiting beliefs from our parents. Our parents didn't believe in abundance. They didn't know to believe in abundance. They were taught lack and limitation, struggle, survival from their parents. So what gets passed down to us today, and so we look around and going, why am I struggling? Where is the, where's the abundance? Well, we don't see it because we weren't taught to see it. We were taught to see limitation. So our work is to actually, man, I, I just keep going back to your backpack story and the rocks there, is to unpack the limiting rocks and to throw them out and then throw the backpack out. And we go, oh my God, look at it. abundance. It's been here all along. So again, it goes back to the belief clearing. I really think that's the secret. The more we can clear our beliefs, the more we get rid of the limitations, the more we can see abundance. I also believe that that's, a, that's kind of a lifetime job. I believe we're all here to awaken but the awakening comes by grace. It's not something we can manufacture. We can not wrestle it to the ground. You can't do, you know, like 100 hours of meditation and then suddenly you are awake. Awakening comes by grace. So what do we do? We work on ourselves. We do the belief work. We do the gratitude work. We meditate. We contemplate. We do all the things that the divine conspiracy has sent us to our room to do. And as a result of that, at some point, we might awaken. And we might have that Satori or enlightenment experience. But until then, we need to unpack the knapsack and throw the limiting block, the rocks out. Because abundance is our natural state. I love that. And I know we have four more minutes. So I'm just going to talk about a, a scene that I saw in a movie called The Peaceful Warrior, yeah. uh, where this gymnast, he's in the shower and remembering his... He, he finds this mentor called Socrates in the movie and he's, he's looking at uh, the water drips coming down to his hand and, and, and remembering the quote, there is never nothing going on. Uh, so can we just talk about that? There's so much things going on all the time. Uh, how do we know what to like stay focused and hearing the beautiful voices that are here instead of all the screams and the negativity? I've not seen the movie, but I know the book and I know Dan Millman and I know what you're talking about. For me, how do I explain this? In any one moment, science says there's about 15 million bits of information. 15 million, and it might even be more. I might have the number wrong, I think it's 40 million. But whatever you look at it, you can't keep up. It's staggering, you would go insane, it would just, drown you, would swamp you. There's no way to keep up with it. So what do we pay attention to? We're hardwired to pay attention to survival. So we're aware of about seven bits of data in any one moment out of that 14 to 40 million bits of data. So our brain is screening all the moments. It's screening every moment. It's screening this moment right here. And it's only letting you be aware, consciously aware of things that are a threat to your survival which is one reason the mainstream news, news plays our buttons and pulls our strings. It's playing on survival and our brain's hardwired to pay attention to survival, so we pay attention to that because we want to survive. So first of all, being aware of that. Second, and I talk about that in the Money Love Speed book, 
you can rewire your brain for something beyond survival. And this is where an intention comes in. I'm a great believer in stating intentions. Now, when you go into a karate tournament, I'm pretty sure that you want to win. You have an intention, an overriding intention, and all the focus is on that intention. Meaning there's 40 billion bits of other information out there, but that is not relevant to you right now. You have told your mind that the only thing relevant to me, the only thing I want to hear about, the seven things that you bring up in any one moment better be oriented to I win this tournament. We all need to do that every day, not necessarily on a karate tournament, but before I went on this call, I set the intention that I wanted to be present with you. I wanted to be inspired and inspiring. I wanted to be um, calm and confident so I can respond to whatever you ask me, knowing I had no idea what we would talk about. We never met before. And I stated the intention to guide me through here. And as you know, I have an important call coming up in about two minutes. In, I think literally two minutes. <laughs> and when I get off, I will kind of go, okay, regroup and refocus, and I'll state my next intention for that next call. So what am I doing? I'm eliminating the distractions. I'm eliminating everything that's not relevant to what I want, and I'm focusing on my attention. That is a big secret. I, again, I talk about it in the Money Love Speed book to, uh, to help us focus. Thank you so much, Dr. Joe. I need to, I know you need to leave. I want to thank you so much for doing this. Uh, if people want to connect with you, where's the best way? I'm all over the place. I'm on Instagram as Dr. Joe Vitale, as Facebook, Dr. Joe Vitale, Dr. Joe Vitale. Twitter is Mr. Fire, M-R-F-I-R-E. Main website has lots of freebies on it called vitalelifemastery.com. Uh, V-I-T-A-L-E, lifemastery.com. And I have a, a $2 offer that should interest your people. The audio of this and the ebook of this, you can have for $2 if you go to moneylovespeedbook.com. Moneylovespeedbook.com. The audio of the book read by me and then the ebook is all there for only two bucks. If you want this kind of a book printed, paperback, you have to go to Amazon and I think it's $20 there. Um, thank you. I'm greatly impressed with you, Peter, greatly in impressed with what you're doing to help people and greatly impressed with your questions. So I'm honored to have been here. Godspeed to everybody and uh, expect miracles. Thank you so much. This has been one of the most incredible conversations I've ever had. Check us out at ilovesuccess.co. I give a couple of free chapters of my book. You can listen to almost 200 of these amazing conversations. Thanks again, guys. We are out. Thank you, Joe. I hope to give you a real hug. Here's a virtual one. Take care and good luck on your amazing call after this. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Thank you.